He recently left me job as a deep sea diver. I work for a large company that offers diving services, ranging from salvage, underwater demolition, ship repairs, and search and recovery. They be a reputable company. It be considered safe and reliable. So much so that they often be contracted by the government. Truth be told, I miss working for them. The people I worked with were truly the best of the best. But there only be so many unexplainable things you can witness before you decide to stay out of the ocean forever. Here be some examples of the secrets many divers take to their graves. On the way to a job we were contracted to perform, our propeller became fouled. I suited up and prepared to make a quick dive to remove the fouling. I did a brief inspection and located thick line wrapped around the prop and shaft. I noted the supervisor, who then lowered a canvas bag with the tools I need to cut it off. I hung the bag from the shaft and began freeing the propeller. It didn't take long, and I returned to my tool bag. I noticed a strange crunching sound when I dropped the tools in the bag. When I looked in the bag, it were full of large shells, many of which I had just crushed. After getting out of the water and stripping off my gear, I began examining them. The shells had what appeared to be hieroglyphics etched into them. I learned from one of the other senior guys that this weren't common, but it happened to several of them before. On another occasion, we were covering a military aircraft. When we arrived, naval ships were there on the scene, waiting for us to recover it for them. We were quickly briefed that they had lost communication with the pilot and wanted us to recover it so they could investigate. I was sitting comms and logs. Communication with the divers monitored depth and bottom time. When the divers reached the project, they reported that the plane were intact. We were all surprised. The supervisor asked how extensive the damage were, and they explained it were completely intact. As in there be no visible damage at all, it were just resting on bottom. Even stranger, the aircraft canopy were still in place. That be meaning that the cockpit was still sealed. In other words, the pilots didn't eject. But there be no sign of the pilot. We recovered the plane, and the military took custody of it. We never heard about it again. I witnessed another strange occurrence from topside at the location for a planned demolition. It'd be necessary to explain that one way you can keep track of a diver be to watch their bubble stream. When a diver inhales, the helmet's demand regulator provides air for their umbilical. Then when they exhale, it is exhausted into the water and floats up to the surface. On topside, you can watch the bubbles and get a general sense of where the divers be. Now on this occasion, we were hundreds of miles away from land, and had placed two divers in the water. About an hour into the dive, we started noticing something strange were happening. There were three distinct bubble streams coming from where the divers were working. At first, we assumed that there were a current and it were affecting them, but soon we noticed a fourth set of bubbles coming from a distance. It stopped about 20 feet from the divers, near the other mysterious bubbles. We asked the divers, but neither could see anything out of the ordinary. Then even from the surface, we could hear a blood-curdling scream from the waters. Then silence. The divers weren't too concerned. We hear strange things all the time. Sound travels well in water, and you learn to assume it be a long distance away. But soon, it looked like the water in the distance were boiling, and it were getting closer. It weren't boiling though, there were countless new bubble streams moving nearer to the location of how divers were working. The supervisor ordered the divers to get onto the dive stage and be lifted to the surface. The bubbles were frighteningly close now, and the divers being lifted said they had begun seeing shadowed figures in the distance. They couldn't quite make out what they were though. We elected to pull the divers out without completing their decompression stops and throw them into our hyperbaric chamber. During another dive in the Bahamas, I had a frightening experience. It were my first salvage job with them, so I got in with a highly experienced diver. And just over 200 feet deep, we were examining a sunken vessel for rigging points. As I approached the bow of the ship, I noticed he were investigating a damaged portion of the hull. He swam a few feet into the ship, looking around. 
I asked him a few times if he wanted me to tend his umbilical air supply holes from outside the ship. It'd be highly advisable since it'd be dangerous to enter a sunken ship, to which he stated no. He didn't want to enter the ship, and he insisted that he were on the porch side of the ship. Assuming that he were disoriented, I reached out to grab him, but just before touching him, I realized there were no bubbles coming from the helmet. Whatever this were, it weren't breathing. I backed up and reported that something else were down here. I expected mockery, but there were nothing. The next thing I heard was the diving supervisor. Both divers, square yourselves away and get ready to leave bottom. When back on the surface, I asked the supervisor about it, and he said that he refused to put his divers in exceptionally dangerous situations. He then refused to clarify. We declined to complete the salvage. I'm not entirely sure how to explain this next dive. I were on bottom, laying on my back staring up toward the surface. All I could see were varying shades of darkness. Suddenly, I came to my senses. I had no memory of how I got here. I realized I couldn't remember getting into the water, or even why I were here. I tried to will my body to stand up, but I realized I couldn't move. I couldn't control my body. Over the comms, I could hear a topside instructing the other divers to find me. How long had I been down here? How long had I been missing? He told topside, they grabbed him. I tried to shout out, but I couldn't even do that. After a few frantic minutes of communication between the divers topside, I noticed a shadow growing clear, and it were moving toward me. Topside, I found him. He reached down and grabbed me harness to drag me back to the dive stage. As he pulled me, I rolled over and got a brief glance at me surroundings. I had been lying on a pile of human bones. One of the strangest things I've ever witnessed happened on a body recovery mission. Even I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't been the one in the water. The military had found a site in which they believed bodies of several missing World War II soldiers would be found. I entered the water with another diver with body bags to carry the remains. On bottom, we eventually found three skeletons. We placed them in the bags and returned to the stage. On our return trip to the surface, we saw the bags begin to move. At first, slightly, then violently shaken and rolling, bubbles escaping from two of the bags and then they went still. The third bag continued struggling. We reached the surface and sat down on the deck, stripping our gear immediately. We were afraid to touch the bags, but one of the tenders eventually unzipped the moving bag. An old, frail, very alive man rolled out coffin water. We stood, shocked, unable to comprehend what we were witnessing. Still not sure what I were doing, I ran over to the other two bags and unzipped them. There were two more old men lying motionless in the bags. They appeared to have just drowned. We attempted CPR, but we were unable to revive the men. The man who was somehow now alive were now backing away from us, screaming at the horrors he had witnessed. He screamed of an eternity spent burning. We locked him in a room, and then contracted the military that we had found a survivor. Within the hour, a military chopper were hovering over us to pick up the two bodies and the survivor. We had placed the bodies back in their bags, and handed them over. The man bent over to inspect them, unzipping the bags. As he opened the bags, an unbearable stench overtook us. The bodies appeared to be in decay, as if they'd been dead and soaking in the water for a week. He zipped it back up and had them lifted to the chopper. Then we escorted him to the survivor. We could hear the screaming from down the hall. We opened the door and saw blood spattered on the walls. He were alive and screaming, but he too appeared to have started decaying. The man calmly walked him to the chopper, and the two of them were lifted on board. We never heard about him again. However, when I went back and examined the room, with his blood, he had drawn hieroglyphics on the walls. I'm still not certain what I viewed, but there were a few things that seemed to stand out. Waves, flames, and bodies. There were a tremendous amount of them on the walls. But shortly after, I walked on in on a supervisor who began scrubbing the walls. He refused to let us examine it any further. 
I have heard rumors about the Keepers of the Deep. I wondered about them for quite some time. I believe they be the link between many of our stories. Their myth within our team be seldom spoke of. But here be what I've gathered over the years. We aren't meant to roam the depths of the ocean. And when a diver loses his life in the deep, it don't stay that way. They be cursed to forever roam the oceans. And when they find the living in an envious rage, they will bring it back to the depths from whence they came. Before I share anything further, there be a few things I'd like to clarify. I received an astonishingly large amount of comments and personal messages since Polston. Several people pointed out to me that there would probably be very few people with experiences like these. And of those people, even fewer could say they've recently left their job. Therefore, there will probably be a lot of people who already know who I be. Or could figure out easily. That being said, I still believe everybody deserves to know. First, I'm going to answer some of the common questions I've received. Yar, I've experienced a lot of terrifying things in the ocean. But when you consider the amount of dives I've made, these experiences have truly been few and far between. Basic information about dive gear. While it do vary based on the job, we do have a standard we typically use. We be hard hat divers, then that be meaning we wear helmets, not scuba. It be surface supplied air. We have an air system on surface which runs through an umbilical down to the divers. The umbilical attaches to the helmet to supply the air. Woven in with the umbilical be our essentials. Without getting too technical, there be a line to supply air, electricity for a light, communications, and essentially a depth gauge. Additionally, we wear a tank on our back as an emergency gas supply. It don't contain much though. Just enough to get to the surface in an emergency. We don't use rebreathers for the work we do. We do, however, occasionally use a full face mask instead of a helmet. Or a scuba, if it be more practical. But it be rarely. The Keepers at the Deep. I never found any information about them online. The only people I've heard discuss them were the members of me team. I've been told other teams have had run-ins with them too. But even me fellow team members be hesitant to speak about them. I'll answer more questions as they arise, but I'll get back to why you're really here. While working on an oil rig, we were utilizing an ROV. Imagine a small remote control submarine to do inspections. We'd been hired to inspect for structural damage and deficiencies after the rig had complained of abnormal vibrations. During observations, the ROVs are tended from a line that offers power a strength member, and transfers video and sonar image back to topside. As the ROV descended into the darkness below, we began to notice thin scratches along the structure. At first it were barely enough to rip the marine growth off the metal, but as we got deeper, the scratches turned to gouges. As we descended even deeper, we began to notice the scratches had appeared deliberate. We pulled the ROV up close to inspect, there before us were images. There were hieroglyphics carved into the metal. And they were fresh. The deeper we got, the older the carvings appeared. They were corroded and partially covered in growth. Whatever was making these carvings were working its way from the bottom. Then the ROV stopped responding. It began shaking back and forth. We lost power to it. We tried to pull it up from its tendon line, but it seemed stuck. Then we felt it, tugging against the line. But it were coming from the ROV side. Something were pulling it deeper. Two more guys jumped onto the line and struggled to pull it back up. The line began creaking. And then broke. We pulled up the remainder of the line, but the ROV were gone and forever. The supervisor were then left with the task of figuring out how to report our findings to the oil company. One incident took place about a year ago. During a salvage job, we were in the process of installing the rigging gear. While facing the ship, with me back to the open ocean, I hadn't noticed anything approaching. Suddenly, something smashed into the tank on my back, hard. I was slammed into the ship, flattened against it by the force. I turned around, 
There were nothing. I would later learn that I had several bruised ribs from that impact. After reporting to the other diver on topside, we were told that they were going to pull us. We got back onto the stage and started being lifted toward the surface. We kept our eyes peeled, scanning into the not too distant shadows. During a decompression stop, we began to see a shadowy figure circling around us. We continued to monitor it as it circled closer and closer. We began to see it more clearly. There were a massive shark circling us. Now, I've never been afraid of sharks. But there'd be something about being circled by a massive shark in the middle of the ocean dangling from a chain that can instill a new phobia in the bravest men. Keep in mind we aren't in an enclosed cage, just a platform to stand on. It felt like we were being served on a platter. It eventually circled close enough to see its features, but it didn't recognize its species. It were bigger than a great white, with entirely different coloration. It were mostly black with a few gray features. It continued eyeing us with a It continued eyeing us as we sat there helpless, praying to be left alone. By the time we completed our decompression requirements, it were nearly close enough to touch. The stage lifted us up and out of the water. Relieved that the shark didn't decide to find out how we taste. On surface, we deduced that the shark lunged at me back, but it only managed to hit the emergency gas supply cylinder. We did another dive, this time in crystal clear waters. And there'd be something nice about getting into waters where you can actually see your surroundings. The visibility were over a hundred feet. We got to the bottom and began work. There were two missiles that had been ejected from the military aircraft and had not detonated. We were briefed on their location and told that they were not armed and would not detonate provided they were handled appropriately. We located them much easier than we expected and began preparing to rig them up. As I laid me hands on the first missile, me dive buddy said, Oh crud. Me stomach dropped. I don't care how many times you've worked with ordnance. I sincerely believe you will always have that uncomfortable sensation in your gut and nervousness in the back of your mind. I looked up and realized he weren't talking about the missile. We saw a wall of sand rising in the distance. Something, hopefully just current, were kicking up the sand from the bottom of the ocean. The wall of sand were growing and were about 30 feet tall. Even worse, it were approaching us. Soon, it were upon us. And it'd be hard to describe what bad visibility does in the water. It ain't a matter of not having enough light. It'd be a matter of too much crud in the water blocking the light. Imagine fog, but imagine if you can that the fog be thicker than anything you've ever witnessed. I'd be talking about fog so thick, you could have a flashlight pointing at your eyes from an inch away, but you'd be completely blind to it. That'd be what bad visibility be like in the water. The moment the sand hit us, we were engulfed in pure darkness. I placed me hand against me faceplate, but I couldn't see it. After a few moments, we began hearing a metallic scraping sound. Then as swiftly as it arrived, the sand were gone. We had crystal clear waters again, except there'd be no sign of the missiles. I had been within arm's reach when the wall of sand hit us, but now, even feeling around under the sand, revealed no trace of them. The next incident occurred during a humanitarian job that we volunteered to perform. After a portion of the bridge collapsed over a 50 foot drop of ocean waters, we volunteered to recover the vehicles, and hopefully the bodies. By the time we arrived on the scene, by the time we arrived on scene, the collapse had taken place just over a week ago. We spent the first day surveying the area and developing a plan to lift most of what we could in a week time frame we had available. By the start of day two, we were actively pulling vehicles off the bottom. It were a difficult job to say the least, but not because of the effort required. The state of disarray in the cars were heartbreaking. These weren't military pilots or sailors lost at sea. These were families on vacation, or people commuting to work. It were hard to say what were harder, 
The cars we found, with an entire family, with the parents' seatbelts unbuckled, and them in the back seats having been trying to unbuckle their children. All the cars where the parents got out, leaving the children buckled in the back seat. I tried not to imagine the panic that had been going on inside the cars as they flooded with broken windshields or windows, as people frantically tried to escape, but I couldn't forgive those who left their families to drown. Each day we moved on to a new section of cars, and on the fourth day we started noticing several cars had their doors open and nobody inside. We were happy to find easier work, especially under the assumption that the tragedy had been lessened by people escaping. That were, until I began rigging a minivan for removal. The family inside weren't so lucky. As I ran slings through the van and prepared it to be lifted, I noticed another diver inspecting the rigging gear. He began undoing one of my shackles. I asked what he were doing and the response were not what I hoped for. I'd be checking his truck for bodies, he said. I felt the familiar sick in me gut sensation. Slowly, I crept over to the diver and turned his body toward me. It resisted, but slowly I turned its face toward me. Its face plates were fogged up. I fought the better judgment. I leaned in close, and I wish to this day that I hadn't. It were dark, but I could all too clearly make out the features. Rotting flesh. The person that were wearing this helmet had long since passed away. I lost my confidence and started to scream. The comms were blazing. Divers topside were frantically trying to get me attention. But I were focused on one thing only. I scrambled backward, away from him. But I had fouled me umbilical around the rigging gear in me state of panic. The thing had again turned its focus to the minivan. As I frantically cleared myself from the slings, I noticed the telltale lack of bubbles coming from the helmet. It were opening the minivan door and reaching inside. As I swam away from the van, I watched it grab one of the passengers and drag it into the darkness. This be when I began to realize I might not be cut off for working beneath the seas. I continued diving for longer than I knew I should have. The entire time, the thought lingering in the back of my mind, I need to get a safer career.